So, um, so we're very excited to kind of uh, think with Pastora about these different kinds of struggles. And um, obviously we're gonna be hearing about uh, care worker struggles and we're gonna be hearing about agricultural worker, worker struggles. In the sessions to come, we'll hear a lot more about some of these struggles. Um, the Jornaleras de Huelva and Lucha that um, Pastora will be talking about will be present in the next session. Uh, of this course also. So we will stay with that, but we really also think it's gonna be really enriching to have care work uh, present with us also, and to think care, not just in the abstract sense with earth care, but to also really think about um, care work as, as a very concrete form of labor and so on. Um, and um, I will just say a few words about Pastora. Um, Pastora is a lawyer and human rights activist. Um, she's uh, specializing in uh, labor and union law and immigration law, and she's a member of the Andalusian um, men and men's and women's workers unions, the, the SAT. Um, she's um, uh, kind of um, combating discrimination against gypsies and member of the um, anti-discriminatory network, uh, the network against uh, the discrimination of gypsies, the Red Anti-Discriminatoria Gitana. Um, she um, defends human rights and works against police violence and repression in that context. And she's published a lot of stuff amongst that, um, a book called, well, I have the title in Spanish. It's gonna be a challenge to translate it so quickly, but uh, um, about uh, the gypsy people against the world system, reflections uh, from the starting point of a uh, feminist militancy and anti-capitalist um, militancy. And um, yeah, we're gonna hear from her about all that. I don't need to say that much. We might be posting links to her text in the chat also, feel very free and uh, yeah, to, to tell us uh, references to texts that you think are relevant, Pastora as well as anybody else. The chat is there for posting materials for anybody so feel free to just uh, put things in there and we will transfer them also to the working pad um and one more thing i want to say about pastora is this how we also get to pastora in a way is that she is part of this kind of emerging um feminist activist uh, research network that's um emerging across spain and latin america it's called la laboratoria which is a super exciting context of, of thinking and, and feminist militancy that we're also going to be cooperating with um, that has issued a, a kind of call for um, feminist social syndicalism also on the occasion of the 1st of May. We will share the link in the chat and in the pad also soon. I don't know if Pastora will say anything about that, but there's really a, a broader, super exciting context behind everything Pastora will be talking about and um, that I want to point to and that we're gonna keep learning from in this course and I hope in general with common ecologies. So that's um, that was enough, I'm sure. Thanks so much for being with us, Pastora. Um, Pastora will speak in Spanish. So anybody who speaks Spanish can just listen in this room and um, otherwise. Uh, yeah, in this channel and otherwise switch to the translation. Over to you, Pastora. Hola, muchas gracias. Muy Hello, contenta. thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, especially with people who have so much interest in these difficult issues, such complex issues that really achieving a media response uh, to the the vision of the women who are working. It's a pleasure to have so many people that are willing to put their hearing and their thoughts and their minds behind this struggle. So thank you to Manuela and to everyone else, uh, uh, and especially to Maggie. Without her translation, it would be impossible to transmit all of these ideas. So I'm going to talk about feminist uh, syndicalism. Although if we wanna be more precise, we should talk about feminist and anti-racist syndicalism. Since time is limited, I'm going to focus on the feminist perspective, but I think afterwards in the debate and in the questions, we should delve more deeply into the anti-racist side. This concept of feminist syndicalism or uh, syndicalist feminism is a concept that we're currently 
uh, endowing with meaning uh, people that are close to this network, the Laboratoria that Manuela has been talking about, which is a space of activist research. And it's been useful in developing this idea to approach specifically the struggle of working women in uh, highly precarious sectors. When we talk about syndicalism, this is what we're talking about, questions that are usually uh, outside the activity of traditional unions or syndical uh, syndicates. Uh, these kinds of these sectors and these women uh, in very precarious sectors uh, have principally been left out of official union structures. Uh, these are generally racialized women. Many of the protagonists of these proposals and these uh, struggles are racialized women in very precarious circumstances. What I wanted to share with you here in this little time and to promote this debate and shape your course are two essential ideas about these struggles uh, around labor rights. First and foremost, these workers with their struggle are visualizing something that I believe is very important, which is that the economic model in which we live, this particular state of capitalism, which is neoliberal, uh, overlooks entirely this reproductive work that that the presenters have just mentioned, this reproductive work, this work of reproducing life, engendering, uh, uh, giving birth, caring, sustaining life throughout the entirety of its existence, this work that has traditionally and historically been invisibilized, the work of women in these sectors and their fight uh, visibilizes this lie of capitalism, this fallacy that tells us that care is something that's outside of the economy, that doesn't have an economic value, that's relegated to the domestic and private sphere, when in fact, the entirety of the economy, uh, or the economy of care, not only forms part of the economic order of the world, but it sustains it. If the reproduction of life itself uh, without that, that reproductive work, work, the entirety of productive work that produces wealth and accumulation uh, would be impossible. So the importance of these struggles, because they are pointing out without perhaps that being their objective, because uh, the persons involved in these, uh, in these struggles, their objective is to have a, a, a life worth living. But what their, what their struggle does is highlight this lie at the heart of how capitalism works. And the second point I would like to highlight is what these women are achieving. These workers that organize themselves in situations of tremendous precariousness and invisibility, uh, situations of sometimes uh, existential collapse, somehow they're managing to organize. And so this, I think, uh, offers us a lot to learn uh, for all emancipatory struggles and, and, and syndical uh, strug struggles. So those are the two poles of what I would like to share with you all today. First, who are these workers? Who are we talking about? Who are these women? that occupy these highly precarious uh, sectors. Principally, in my experience, and I'm a lawyer, I work in a cooperative of women lawyers, and we have supported over the last several years two principal struggles. These are not all the struggles we could talk about in the framework of uh, feminist uh, syndicalism. I think they're exemplary of the kind of struggles we're talking about. First, the, work, the struggle of domestic workers and, uh, and care workers. These are women who work in the sustaining and care of life in exchange for a salary, usually a very modest uh, uh, salary, much below the uh, wealth that they create. And this is a whole sector of work, one that has been traditionally invisibilized. We know that the care uh, that care work has been traditionally been carried out by poor women, women who had no other uh, a better option for achieving an income. Care work has 
been carried out either by the women in the family uh, in a non remunerated way or those with greater acquisitive power have been able to purchase that work, freeing the women of their households uh, from this burden of work, purchasing this work from uh, poorer women or women with less uh, capacity of choice. Uh, in Spain and probably in your respective countries also, this kind of work has been very close to servitude. There is no uh, equality of conditions. There's no balance between the worker and the company uh, or the employer, but rather uh, this takes place, this contracting, this hiring takes place in the context of servitude. Often in Spain, it was women coming from rural places that would come uh, to work inside the home of a wealthier family uh, in exchange for uh, for food, bed and board and some protection. Uh, these were women, women coming from much poorer uh, rural areas. In the present, uh, this, this global periphery has moved farther away and is principally comprised of women from the global south. Presently, the bulk of this care work that is purchased at a very cheap rate in the market is being done by migrant women. Uh, therefore, their struggle is principally being led by migrant women. And so the factor of racialization or the, the, the positioning of these struggles as specifically anti-racist is essential in understanding them. To understand the situation, I need also to uh, work with a concept of patriarchy in order to be able to talk to you clearly about what is going on in these sectors. The idea of the pat patriarchy, which I use, is the patriarchy as a way of or or ordering uh, the economy at a global scale in which there's a criteria of unequal distribution of wealth and of work uh, depending upon the gender of persons, such that the heterosexual male uh, is the ideal and everything outside of that ideal is those, those of us who have difficulties to access the uh, wealth rights and uh, access held by that ideal. So uh, the work and the lives of uh, women and racialized persons is, uh, is cheaper. So uh, the cheaper lives in the world are broadly feminized and racialized. This has been true throughout history uh, due to the uh, division of labor within the capitalist system in which women have been relegated to uh, bear the burden of reproductive work for this to sustain itself. Uh, there has to be a narrative that cheapens the life, the vital capacities and the work of women. This structuring of the economy through patriarchy and capitalism, uh, it's essential to understand it in order to be able to understand the struggle of uh, women in this sector. So at the present, the, these regimes of servitude explicitly no longer uh, exist or are not as common, but uh, still the legal rights of domestic workers is not in the Spanish state uh, equal to the rights of other workers. Workers of other sectors have a specific regime, uh, while the social security system has a very spe has a special regime uh, for domestic workers. This translates into lesser rights and lesser guarantees uh, when it comes to leveling the uh, positions of power between the employer and the employee. One of the characteristics of domestic work uh, in the present is the lack of any access to unemployment uh, benefits. This exists in all of the other sectors of work and in this sector does not. There, I don't want to only focus on this demand, but it is a very important one because uh, this guarantees a reduced uh, 
conflictivity. When you demand uh, greater rights, you always run a risk of, of uh, being fired and therefore losing access to your income. In this sector, it's much more terrifying to demand your rights because when you are no longer employed, there is no guarantee uh, of unemployment rights or any kind of basic uh, income. This is also a very atomized uh, uh, space of labor. This is not the big factories of the uh, cynical imaginary where workers come together and come to agreements in order to carry out a strike or a demand. Uh, rather, each worker is locked in a separate house with a separate employer with separate conditions. And this makes it extremely difficult to carry out a cynical struggle. There's also a line, a very, a, a very uh, blurry line between life and work. There's also the modality of internal work in which a person lives and works inside the same home uh, in which you sleep, eat, and live inside your workplace. Uh, those who work in this regime say that there is no line, there is no beginning and end to your work day. Uh, there's no moment at which your life begins and, and your work ends. And this makes it extremely difficult to uh, organize from a syndical perspective. So uh, I'm naming all of these difficulties in order to draw attention to the fact that this struggle is managing to organize itself uh, despite and through all of these difficulties. And I think that's a testimony to the value of this struggle. I'm speaking about domestic workers, but I think they're very closely related to other sectors that are also closer, closely related to uh, care-based work, like for example, uh, uh, home care workers, uh, that go to different households to uh, help people in situations of dependence, but also cleaners, janitors, workers who work within uh, uh, elderly homes, all of these sectors that are highly feminized, highly racialized and highly precarious, uh, because according to this uh, racist and patriarchal ordering of the academy, this is the population that has the least access to, uh, to uh, the, so they have few choices but to accept this, even though they are workers that are essential to the sustaining of life itself. We say that when we were all stuck at home in the uh, pandemic, this work could not stop. That uh, slogan, without us, the world stops, was clearer than ever during COVID because uh, if cleaning stopped, if caring stopped, if caring for children and elderly people stopped, the world would cease to function. And I think that's very, very important. So the other, how am I doing? Manuela, can you tell me uh, about how I'm doing with time? Just indicate how you have five more minutes, more or less. OK, great, thanks. Another work sector that's highly uh, precarious is field workers. This is essential also to the economy. And when the world stopped due to the pandemic, the agricultural sector could not stop. Agriculture, especially in the southern, southern, southern Europe, southern Spain, 90% of the people who work in the fields are migrants. Women represent a smaller number than men, but they've always done the least well-paid work within the uh, agricultural work. So in the collecting of olives, for example, men uh, shake the trees and women collect the fallen olives. So it's less well-paid and physically more demanding. What I'm trying to describe is the situation of the Moroccan contract workers uh, in the strawberry collection in, uh, in Andalusia. And I think this is a very clear example that allows us to understand the articulation between uh, patriarchy uh, and colonialism in, 
in the economy. Uh, in Huelva, some 90% of the strawberries produced for, for Europe, uh, the European market, are produced there. Since 2000, one, a idea was conceived to contract uh, some of the workers directly from their country of origin, bring them to Huelva during the spring season when the strawberries are collected and then send them back to their country of origin, origin at the end of the season. From the beginning, they only hired women. This is a very poorly paid, poorly recognized and physically arduous task. Uh, it, it's a task that would have generated a lot of uh, labor uh, demands. And so they sought the population that had the least capacity to generate uh, union conflictivity. Initially, they hired these women from Eastern Europe and then later from Morocco. What they demand is that they be mothers of a minor child uh, residing in their country of origin because this guarantees that they will return to their country of origin. Uh, so they specifically sought out the most exploitable possible uh, profile in order to pay them the lowest uh, salary and in order to make them work very hard. This is a, uh, a woman, a non-white woman, a mother. This is what we're talking about when we talk about intersectionality. So when you have the opportunity to listen to the Jornaleras de Huelva en Lucha, uh, you'll, you'll hear them. But the fact that this these women are visibilizing the way in which patriarchy and capitalism uh, go hand in hand, uh, the same example we can find in the maquilas, in the factories, in border areas around the world, uh, the poorest women are always occupying these spaces. Now, the interesting thing here is in these sectors, they are managing to organize uh, union uh, struggles. And the model of syndicalism that they are uh, putting together is what we're calling social syndicalism. They've had to figure out how to organize themselves when there's not a common factory, not a common workplace, not a common uh, hire or employer. They figured out how to organize themselves when uh, their times are extremely limited or uh, diffuse. So they have to sustain their lives, not outside of their workspaces, sustaining their own lives. We're talking about uh, dealing with housing, with uh, uh, sexist violence, with uh, finding food, with sharing foods. I can't go on very much because I'm running out of time and I like to be strict about timing, but I do believe that the deregulation that's coming, that which makes us all uh, uh, work online in which our uh, workplaces are disappearing, where we don't have the opportunity to encounter our colleagues, this kind of platform work in which our uh, employer is uh, invisible, is perhaps a mobile phone. We need to be able to reinvent what a union structure looks like. And we don't have to invent it from nothing because there are already people, specifically extremely precarious non-white women that have already been organizing from this perspective, from this experience of total deregulation and they've managed to, uh, we must learn from them. In the encounter that we had uh, in 2020 and 2022 here in Spain, the uh, uh, biosyndicalism encounter, the encounter between the riders, the platform delivery workers and the domestic workers, they're confronting very similar uh, situations in the sense of atomized workplaces, the loss of work uh, guarantees, situations in which their work is not uh, perceived as work, the lack of division between workspace and life space. And in the coming years, this is going to become progressively more important because the entire working class has to reinvent itself. We need to look uh, at our sectors, not with a supremacist ver vision. This is a university of experience, of social syndicalism, of uh, 
of eating together, of sharing housing, of sustaining life itself in these spaces. I'm going to stop there and then in the debate we can go into greater detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, we switch to English now again. Pastora um, will have Maggie translate and um, Pua will facilitate. Um, we're going to have two rounds of questions. Um, this time around, we thought that we will have them um, not written in the chat, but we give people the chance to speak. Um, we would ask you to be brief though. Um, already, if you have a question, please put an asterisk into the chat. So we, um, we start to kind of get a list of people that want to ask something or make a comment or um, you can also raise your hand, but it's especially useful if you put something into the chat. Thank you. Um, and Bua is going to facilitate that part. Mm -hmm. We are starting to have, we've got one question there. Maybe we should just start with Mariana. Yeah. And um, it should be possible, Mariana, for you to just go. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. I think I will uh, speak in Spanish, if I may, if Maggie allows me. <laughs> of course. We would just have to then have people switch. No, 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 no it's okay. fine. Just Maggie can do it. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. Gracias, Pastora. Voy a Thank you, Pastora. I'm going to speak in my, my mother tongue, taking advantage of the fact that you're here and that we share our language. First of all, I wanted to thank you deeply for this presentation, the clarity with which you uh, explain the concepts and describe these struggles is magnificent. Uh, we're really grateful for this clarity. I'm also working with an organization of indigenous rural women called Anamure in Chile. It's the largest association of peasant women in Chile. And recently, just two years ago, they created a union, a syndicate, a, a, a syndicate of women of the land and the sea. It's deterritorialized because what it tries to do is work with what we call in Chile temporeras. So it's a, I imagine it's similar to what you call jornaleras in Spain. They're day workers or temporary farm workers. The peculiarity is that it's not a specific region, like in the case of Huelva. It's rather an attempt to uh, build a syndicate with national representation. And I wonder how you think about this challenge of making a feminist uh, syndicalism, not only in a given territory, but at a national level, in the context of the peasant struggles, and on the other hand, see what connections or what alliances might be created between the Anamuri syndicate and the Jornaleras de Huelva, perhaps an invitation to continue working on these issues together and generate synergies there. Thank you very much. I think if we could manage to have another question or two, then maybe we would um, pile them on top of each other a little bit. Um, is there anybody, and thanks very much, Mariana, um, super interesting. <laughs> um, is there anybody who wants to just kind of um, add another comment or question right now? Then um, don't be shy, feel free. We're still getting to know each other in this course. It's lovely to have the chance to also see people speak. Okay, so Anna Carolina Minozzo is gonna go. I can also ask in Spanish, whatever is easy. Um, um, gracias, Pastora, por esta... Thank you, Pastora, for speaking so clearly and so strongly, I was thinking, in the end, you spoke about how these struggles, these alternatives, these paths are already being built by these women and by people in feminist movements. 
And there my question is about the difference between a feminist discourse that, uh, that's sort of more academic and the practices that already exist. Because right now we're hearing a lot of talk about in the context of, of feminist philosophy and uh, feminism of thinking together to seek new possibilities. And in your text and in your presentation, which you just gave, there's an inversion that's, I think, very powerful that alternatives already exist, but they're not perhaps being written into our feminist imaginary yet for various reasons. And so I'm interested in your perspective on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Um, Is there anybody who would like to go quickly? Um, then be very welcome. Let's give it another few seconds. And if not, we can pass to Pastora for a first round of answers. But please um, feel very invited. Bueno, these are high level questions. And thank you very much for asking in Spanish, moreover. And thank you also to Maggie for translating. Now, Mariana, I like what you said about Anamuri, I think it's this proposal of making a union at a national level is very important. I think at this moment, we have the challenge of reinventing syndicalism. I am a syndicalist. I form part of a union I, that's coming out of the, the agricultural work but uh, in Andalusia, but it, it's, uh, it starts out as a Andalusian uh, uh, laborers union uh, because Andalusia is a colony within Spain. But I think of this model, much of this model is uh, outdated. I think there's a lot of wisdom from the history of syndicalism that we can't abandon, but the, the struggle itself has to be reinvented. Uh, if the reality that Mariana is talking about is a reality that is uh, scattered or delocalized, scattered around the territory, then we just have to figure out a model of struggle that's also decentralized and scattered uh, within the territory. So in the case of Huelva, this is a very local reality. What we're bidding for is trying to make a kind of syndicalism that uh, is throughout this the whole Spanish state, because there are other forms of, uh, of agricultural labor in other parts of the state. And there's a nomadism, this sort of transhumance between uh, one, uh, one agricultural season and another. We call it the root of the, of the uh, uh, seasonal agricultural workers. They go from Huelva to Almeria, into Catalonia, to Valencia, uh, depending upon the, uh, the season of different agricultural harvests. It's extremely precarious. They're living in shanty towns. Uh, this is an absolutely essential uh, labor force that's sustaining a sector as important as agriculture for Spain, but in extremely precarious circumstances. Uh, what would be ideal would be something like Anamuri. Uh, that's operating throughout the whole country. Likewise, for uh, domestic workers, we're all organized in different local uh, organizations, but these workers are uh, having the wisdom and the, the power to build uh, statewide networks um, and to be in contact with each other. And these are women that are working uh, endless hours and at the same time being able to organize themselves. So being able to respond at a local level and also in this scattered and decentralized way is key. And migrant people know a lot about this. Migrant women uh, have a lot of experience with this so they can only uh, enrich a proposal like what you're describing. And Ana Carolina, to respond to your question, I think 
political practices and political theory should go hand in hand. Sometimes uh, theory is one step behind practice if we want to do something that's truly transformative. Sadly, this idea of the Western intellectual academic superiority often overlooks, it often imagines uh, that emancipatory projects are going to uh, uh, seek out responses in books, in texts, in theory. And I think that gaze has to be inverted. I think we need to look to the margins. My political proposal is always to look to the margins because when the state doesn't sustain us and consumption uh, doesn't sustain us because there's no resources to buy what we need, there's no choice but to build emancipatory and uh, revolutionary practices at the margins, not driven by ideology, but rather in a shanty town of day laborers, life cannot be sustained if you don't have collective practices. There's an enormous amount of experience there in sustaining life. The kind of feminism that you've described as, as academic has to have the humility of looking uh, into those spaces where nobody else looks, where generally people only look with condescendence and uh, paternalism and understand that they're pioneering I think that black feminism in the United States has provided a huge amount, uh, has contributed a lot to this intersectional uh, way of looking. In my personal work, both with uh, migrant and syndical structures, as well as the anti-discriminatory work with the Roma population, uh, we have to see that it was the reality of black women in extremely precarious uh, circumstances uh, that were having enormous difficulties getting their demands recognized both by the anti-racist movement and by the feminist movement. Uh, these are the ones that, that uh, provided us with these theoretical tools. So I think in the margins are always uh, generating new practices. Uh, we have to have the wisdom to look to them and acknowledge them and learn from them. Thank you, Pastora. Um, let's have some more asterisks or hands. Um... Uh, is anybody for asking a little question or making a little comment? Um, can wait a moment. Um, if not, while we wait, I can make a little comment. Um, should I do that? Just to um, pass the time, obviously many, many thoughts, but please people um, um, feel free to speak. I will, I will try and keep this brief. Um, and I'll say it in English, um, just to, to kind of give the non-Spanish speakers a little bit of a break also. Um, uh, we're doing this podcast the, called the Earthcare Fieldcast, in which we're preparing a lot of the sessions of this course. And we're also looking into a lot of the questions that Pastora has been speaking about. And one thing we heard many times that's really interesting also is that uh, many times um, we've heard this, in, for instance, in a conversation with folks from Romania um, that are involved in agroecology there and subsistence farming, is that many times people who will do uh, have small farms, they will also go um, to be seasonal agricultural workers abroad. For instance, with Romania, you know, Austria would be one of those countries that people go to for a few months in the summer to harvest. Um, but many of them also actually work as care workers in other seasons. So, you know, you have sometimes the very same people that are also doing these jobs interchangeably, depending on the season and so on. So, you know, care workers who will come for, who will be on a rotational basis doing domestic 24-hour uh, care, um, uh, but also then in other seasons working as, um, you know, agricultural labor force and at the same time being engaged in, in, in sort of different forms of subsistence farming at home, which... Uh, it's really interesting, I think, as a link and poses a lot of questions about, you know, what kind of uh, political subjectivity there is there also, because you have this kind of, you have agroecology as a practice there, but you have the experience of migrant labor and you have the link between, 
you know, those life-sustaining labors, which care is obviously life-sustaining, but, you know, agriculture to some extent also is life-sustaining because it's, um, it's about the, what in Spanish, the feminists, in Spain, the feminists talk a lot about the reproduction of life, no? La, la reproducción de la vida, or the sustaining of life, the sosten, sostenimiento de la vida. Um, so there's a lot of um, affinity between these, um, these kinds of work. And um, I just wanted to point to those episodes we made. Um, and also, um, obviously within the pandemic, those kinds of work are exactly what people have called essential work, uh, you know, applauded a little bit, but totally have been failed, failed to be recognized in any proper way or getting better pay and condition and so on. And I think there's a lot of campaigning that is even off the back of the pandemic also keeps happening. Also, I mean, we see this a lot in Austria and Germany and like, I think in many, many countries, this, this, um, this is becoming increasingly politicized. Um, yeah, and we will have a, a next episode with um, some of the women that Pastora also writes about in the booklet um, with the Territorio Domestico Collective of, um, of kind of migrant women uh, care workers in Madrid. Um, and with a collective called Mujeres Unidas Entre Tierras um, in, in Barcelona. Let's see, has a hand emerged while I have been rambling on? Yes, Yenitsa. Hi, uh, thank you for that talk. Um, I guess this is more just a, maybe a, a basic question about syndicalism. Um, I guess I'm curious, like what, uh, like what kind of leverage um, these, you know, women caregivers, field workers have, like when they're not, um, you know, organized in a single factory or, you know, under, in, in, you know, in one, in one place, like what is the, what is like the revolutionary potential there? Like, um, yeah, I guess like I, I think I just don't know. I don't quite understand syndicalism. <laughs> it's a very basic question. Um, if you could speak to that. Okay, and there's another one coming in too. Thank you, Yenitsa. Um, Katalin would also like to ask a question. Uh, and then Livia, maybe I'll just quickly read that out, is asking, uh, dear Pastora, could you say a little bit about how the struggle reaches the legal system to confront corporations? Um, Stora is taking notes. <laughs> um, okay, so maybe we pass over to Katalin and then we give Pastora a chance to answer. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Can you hear me actually? Okay, great. So, <laughs> I actually wanted to go a bit more into the practice of uh, organizing in these two fields, so both in care work and in, uh, in seasonal agriculture work, and a bit um, coming back to Manuela, what you were saying and what Pastora has also been talking about, that uh, if we think about the women who are doing these jobs and who are indeed going from uh, seasonally, sometimes doing agriculture work, sometimes doing care work, returning home, sustaining life at home, taking care of families at home. Uh, and um, so doing a whole, uh, I mean, incredible spectrum and, uh, and also scale of both uh, reproductive and productive labor. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm living now in Austria. I'm originally from Hungary. So I follow a lot of these cross-border movements between let's say the Eastern and Western European context. And what I find interesting, and here I would be really interested in also Pastora's experience as a, as a lawyer, like how to navigate all these different struggles in practice, because, for example, in Austria, care workers are self-employed, agriculture workers are employed, but uh, the like the, the wages uh, differ from uh, region to region. So, so I'm just wondering also about all the knowledge you need. And of course, that's very difficult to acquire individually. And uh, I mean, there are several campaigns and, uh, and also, I mean, in Austria as well as in other countries to inform people about uh, their, their, their rights, like in these different areas. But I'm really 
I mean, I'm really wondering about how it's possible to make struggles collective, especially in contexts where uh, migrant workers are coming from different language uh, regions. So, they, so you don't speak the same language and very often you are very short time in the same place. And uh, also because one of, I'm part of a campaign for uh, called Saisonary in Austria. And I know that one of the difficulties is also uh, like uh, taking care of the relations that are established, like how to keep in touch and who has what capacity to keep in touch. So of course, supporting activists have very different capacities, uh, but not always, but still like uh, are, are in a different position than many of the migrant workers themselves. So I, I would be just very curious about uh, like experiences uh, that uh, that uh, Pastora had in in this uh, in this very practical field of organizing. Okay, um, the Sezoneri that Katalin is part of, they will be in our next session also, um, in dialogue with the Jornaleras. So it will be a really exciting session, and we also have an, uh, um, a podcast show with them, um, where what's really interesting, where what they say is that it's mostly women doing that work in the campaign also. So they also have a nice feminist reflection on, on the, the campaigning, campaigning as care. I think that's what uh, Lisa says in the interview, um, organizing as care. But anyways, uh, we would pass to Pastora for an answer and we do have two more questions, but I think let's give Pastora some chance to answer and then have just another round because I think the discussion is really interesting right now. Sí, muchas gracias. Sí, la verdad Thank que you son... very much. Really, these are fantastic questions. Each one of them would uh, be give us room for a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, Jenica, my, I love that you asked this question of what is syndicalism, and I'm sorry because I I take for granted that this concept is uh, that we all share it, but but there's no reason why we should. Uh, syndicalism is the self organization of workers the self-organization of workers to fight for their rights uh, faced with a specific employer or company. This is how syndicalism has taken shape since the 19th century. And it has taken shape very much in the context of factories. But of course, having a factory makes things easier. A lot of people in one same place with one same problem and one same source of the problem, which is the business or the company that doesn't want to pay higher salaries or wants to require longer uh, work days, etc. So syndicalism and uh, worker struggles uh, arise from the antagonism between the owners and the workers. The less you pay the workers, greater profits the uh, company enjoys. So they have a necessarily antagonistic uh, interest. This is from a Marxist perspective an unresolvable uh, problem until the workers themselves become the uh, owners of the factory, uh, in which case the wealth being obtained by the production would go directly to the uh, the the workers. Uh, so this is class struggle. And in order for the working class, in order to to claim its rights and uh, it needs to self-organize itself. Okay, so that is what is syndicalism. But what takes place, how do we do syndicalism in a context in which there's no factory, there's no single employer? So how do you self-organize in a situation in which your uh, situation is totally individualized, totally atomized? And that's where really the innovation and the power of these, uh, these workers is. And you very intelligently ask, how do you do that? The experience of the domestic workers is very interesting because what they've done, they have to organize outside of their workplace. So they create associations of domestic workers who meet on Sundays, which is the one day they tend to have off. And in these meetings, they do a lot of things. They have a coffee, they 
They like share their stories. They tell their lives. They help each other out. When you don't have housing and you need to look for a new place to live, uh, you can share it when you're having a hard time bringing your, your, these are principally migrant women. So you're trying to bring your children over. The self-organization of these women is not the old idea of the factory in which the workers organize to just achieve more salaries. Rather, this is a different kind of organization, the essence of which is to sustain the life of the workers outside of the framework of the owners. They say that there's a magic word. In my association, they say X. They say, I have to, uh, I have to charge X per hour. Uh, the fact of being able to name an association or name a, a union uh, changes the balance of power between the employer and the employee. And so the women of Territorio Domestico, uh, I don't know if you'll talk about that further on in the course, I'm sure you will. Uh, they say something that I think is fantastic. They say to fight, in order to be able to fight, first we had to be able to sustain ourselves and each other. So in housing, in food, in psychological support, in order to have the strength to uh, come up with a struggle. And that's what traditional unionism or syndicalism uh, doesn't take into account. You no, know? it, it conceives uh, syndicalism much more as like a specific office that you go to that has to do only with the, uh, the legal status of your employment. But what we're calling social syndicalism is much broader in its uh, in what it includes and what it. I'm really grateful, Jenica, for uh, your asking this question. I think it's very important background. Now, another thing that I wanted to respond to, Catherine, uh, when you say, "How did they do this?" I think this is the response that actually works. These we had a workshop called Know Your Rights, right? We still we still do this workshop. And this has been a space of great political power because normally the person who is uh, suffering a situation of exploitation feels ashamed. She feels like it's her problem. You've had bad luck. When, and then on one of these Sunday meetings that, uh, that I'm talking about, having a coffee and telling each other story, it turns out other people have this problem too. Your employer makes you work more works, more hours than appears in your contract, or they make you work on your uh, vacation days, or that they make you do things that you weren't supposed to have to do. These are common problems and they're very powerful politically because people start to think about solutions at a collective level. They start to understand that this problem is not my problem. This is a problem for all of us. And so that is the leap to a form of political thinking, which is collective. When we, the lawyers, give these workshops of know your rights, as Caroline says, how much you have to charge, how much rest time are you entitled to? Yes, you have a right to vacations, how much, when, etc. When you give that information in a workshop, it, you start creating a collective notion of what the problem is. And there's a lot of political power to that. Catalina's reflection is uh, much deeper. And I'd love to sit down, Catalina, and have a coffee with you and talk about all of these things. But uh, I think this idea of understanding the collective and the common is uh, maybe a starting point. They want us alone isolated and uninformed. If we're isolated and uninformed, we're more vulnerable and we're cheaper. Our lives are work worth less, our work is worth work less. When we're organized and when we know our rights, I'm not saying that we're equal, but it the balance tips a little bit. There's a little bit more of a, ba a balance. We work towards a balance. And so that's why it's so important to self-organize especially when capitalism not only exploits work, it exploits uh, with housing, with the price of water, with access to health care. There's a whole process of dispossession of rights at all different levels, not only at the, in the workplace. And therefore, the forms of self-organization have to be able to think beyond the workplace.
And these women are already doing that because they've had no other choice. And that's where the political power of what they're doing lies from my humble perspective. So Livia was asking, how do you get this to the courts, to the legal system? It's not easy. But when people know their rights, it's easier or at least more possible to be able to fight in the courts if you don't even know what your salary should be by law, you do not, you just lower your head and accept it. But if you know your rights, your capacity to demand, uh, uh, to make demands and to uh, go to court is much greater. Or if you have a lawyer that's supporting you from your association or from your syndicate, uh, so I think that is only possible when people are self-organized. I'm so sorry, uh, Manuela, for going on so long, but they're great questions. Uh, really great. Um, two more questions from the chat. Um, I will just read them unless people want to also say them out loud. Um, should I just read them or? Sure. Yeah. Um, so one question was um, from Andy, um, which was an addition to the question by Yenica about syndicalism is, could you say a bit more about biosyndicalism? Um, and then, <clears throat> and then the question from Bua. Do you want to say yeah, that I can yourself? Say that as well. yeah. So when, when we uh, interviewed the uh, Jornaleras, the Huelva and Lucha, they spoke about how the agriculture in the region is destroying the aquifer uh, and, and the kind of natural uh, park area that's quite special of that region. Um, and also exhausting the water resources that are available to humans. Um, so they're, they're quite aware of the kind of very harmful ecological impact of the work. But they also want, of course, to defend their livelihood. And, and this is a real contradiction uh, that they would like to will ultimately have other kinds of work that are not harmful. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in, in, in how you look at, at this kind of uh, challenge uh, and how to overcome it. So if, you've, if you've thought. Okay. For the question of biosyndicalism, I think I responded already. This social syndicalism that is a means of self-organization, not focused exclusively on the workplace, but also in other spaces of life in which we're also suffering processes of dispossession and exploitation. So with this idea, we, we try to uh, enclose all of these ideas uh, in either biosyndicalism or social syndicalism, which I think are kind of the same thing. So the last question, this is a very difficult one. Traditionally, syndicalism and the sustainability, environmental sustainability have been often uh, head to head in confrontation because the workers have only had the possibility of achieving uh, income by selling their work uh, energy to a, a company or an employer that also exploits the environment and natural resources. This prison in which you have to uh, you have to work for an employee makes you desire to exploit the uh, the earth, the land, and the resources because it is your only way to achieve. But stepping out of that means opening up the capacity to imagine a future possible uh, economic system that doesn't exist today that we have to be able to imagine uh, in order to be able to imagine something that goes beyond. Uh, income in in the sense of salary and especially this is especially difficult in a situation in which the uh, the vital situation the life situation is so uh, intensely precarious uh, to be able to simply buy the materials in order to build a, a hut in a shanty town so here there's a real responsibility 
in the hands of researchers and academics. And uh, I think this is where the power of the uh, academy, I think, steps in that Ana Carolina mentioned. I want there to be, uh, it, it I want there to be researchers that are investigating the possibility of a totally different system in Huelva, for example. Uh, we need proposals. We need proposals of a different productive system. We need somebody thinking of, and researching about how to transform agriculture. Because if they don't open that window of opportunity of possibility for us, it's going to be very difficult for us to get past simply demanding uh, access to an income. So there we need scientific research and academic research to join the struggle and think about how are we going to sustain the workforce in Wilva through a more sustainable model of production. And I think we could do it. things um, we want to think about in this course also by bringing together you know these stories of labor struggles but also agroecological movements and so on and uh, this uh, where there can be this kind of cross fertilization potentially um, um, Ariana is asking where we can find more about biosyndicalism I think some people might be able to post I think we can post some links in a minute um, we went a little bit over time with the questions but it's an amazing debate um, we thought um, to uh, have some working, some breakout groups also, however, to give people a chance to talk in kind of uh, smaller circles, and then we will come back uh, to Pastora once more. Um, so if it's okay, I will talk you through our proposal for the breakout groups. We will make them a bit shorter than planned because we went a bit over time now, but I guess that's okay. 